Hey guys, I'm really excited for this conversation. Rob Greenlee is a podcast hall of famer. He has podcast, multiple podcasts, and now he is partnered with StreamYard. So check out StreamYard. Um, I actually am affiliated more with Riverside FM. So if you're interested in using uh, Riverside as your podcasting platform, you know, reach out. Or if you have an interest in StreamYard, connect with Rob. We will put those links down below. Um, and, you know, we're both also really excited to share what we've learned with video podcasting. And so we're going to use this conversation to try and educate you about all the tricks that you can use and the tools that will help make it easier for you if you're interested in becoming a thought leader through podcasting. Um, and so just make sure that you're really taking notes and checking the description for those links because I'll also make sure I put a link to some solo content creator um, equipment and I'll even um, link my website. It's called On Cam Ready, just in case you want to reach out. I have a newsletter on LinkedIn and also on Substack where I offer uh, resources to help you become more on camera ready from social media to podcasting to television interviews because I offer media training. So check out my website and all the links below. Rob and I have a lot um, planned for this conversation. We're gonna really devote as much attention as possible to the details of what it is to create a podcast, a video podcast. So let me just take um, two seconds and I'll get ready for this conversation and join you with Rob Greenlee. Hello, everybody, and hello, Rob. How are you? I'm so glad you could join us. Yeah, it's terrific to be here, Jamie. It's <laughs> uh, it, it's always good to talk to you. You know, I, I, I'm going to be transparent. I was trying to get this on LinkedIn Live for everybody, but I could not get that button to put this out. And guys, that's the reality some of us face if you're trying to do it all and you're doing, you're creating your podcast, you're putting together your videos, cutting your social media clips, posting things on LinkedIn, trying to do your lives. It's a lot to juggle. And unfortunately, I couldn't figure it out and I'm going to look into it. But yes, I'm really glad Rob could join us. Um, thank you so much, Rob. I really do appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, I'm excited for, you know, the topics we want to talk about today. I think it, they're really important to content creators that are trying to work with um, all these tools and you know, what happened to you today is a, is a good example of what mm -hmm. can happen. And will oftentimes, if you're a creator will probably happen. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. so everybody today, we are talking about video podcasting. Mm -hmm. And, um, again, if you're listening on YouTube, I hope you subscribe to this channel and check out Rob Greenlee on YouTube as well. Subscribe to us both. If you can on, po on your podcasting platforms, make sure you give us a like and find Rob Greenlee. Um, his post, his podcasts are linked below in the description. So make sure you check out Rob. Um, Rob, you join, you're joining us after recording your own podcast, right? So why don't you tell us a little bit more about what you have going on these days? Well, yeah, I've been a content creator since um, about 1999. I was on the radio mm -hmm. and then I progressed on my radio show for many years in XM Salad Radio Network and just kind of moved up the the ranks and and have been working at this for a long time and work for a lot of podcast hosting platforms over the years Microsoft Xbox I uh, worked on podcasting at Microsoft for seven years and and then um, yeah, all along I've been doing my own shows uh, to some degree most of them have been shows for the particular platform I was working for at the time like Spreaker I did a the Spreaker live show for many years and and did a lot of content when I worked at Lipson as well. I didn't do the official podcast there. Uh, and then now that I've left all that and uh, now I'm working with the, the StreamYard folks um, and helping create podcast related content on their channels and helping, um, you know, you, YouTubers and video creators think a little bit about the podcast medium as a alternative distribution method. So, yes. so that's, that's what I do out there. I'm trying to walk this line, trying to learn myself and then help others mm -hmm. to um, maximize their experience of creating content um, on yeah. the video and audio side, which podcasting has a deep roots in video. And a lot of people don't realize that that are new to the medium that podcasting really started 
supporting video and audio. Um, and it just, the more modern times, it's been seen primarily as an audio only medium. And, uh, but I think times are changing, you know, and, and short form content, long form content is starting to really take off. Yeah. And it's helpful to have that video content readily available because, I mean, if you're scrolling in any social media feed, mm -hmm. I mean, think about it, guys, if you're listening, like how many of you stop when you just see an audio recording? Not, I mean, think about it. I, when I think about it, I'm like, well, I kind of pass over those. You know, I typically want to see people on camera talking to me mm -hmm. over audio lines. I don't know, Rob, how have you, when you scroll, what do you stop on? Yeah, I tend to want to see things too. I think there are people mm -hmm. out there that are visually oriented and want to want to see the people that they're consuming content from mm -hmm. and to connect with them at that level. Um and then there's other folks that are into audiobooks and they're into audio and and that's okay. Um mm -hmm. you know, I think podcasting can embrace all the different levels of consumers out there of mm -hmm. the of the content and I think that's the real key message that I'm really focused on now is just trying yeah. to create one piece of content and repurpose it into audio and video. Yeah, it's great. And I love what you're doing, guys. I actually appeared on his StreamYard podcast yeah. YouTube channel. <laughs> I think, you, know, you were my second guest, I think, on that mm -hmm. show, right? Yeah, it was. A, I was very um, thankful to be a part of that um, your beginning with StreamYard, that podcast. Mm -hmm. And it's um, on YouTube, guys. I shared a clip on my own YouTube channel. But again, be sure to find Rob Greenlee and StreamYard. You can also see his podcast listed down below um, in the videos that YouTube offers. So check it out. He is really great on selecting key guests. And that's one thing <laughs> I want to make sure that we talk about is selecting guests, prepping guests and really building out a show around guesting. So for this conversation today, we're going to be talking about video podcasting with a guest. We're not yeah. going to be focusing on a narrative podcast or any other type of podcast other than a guest podcast. Right. Now, what I would really like to do while we have Rob with us is is look at how our thought leaders listening can really start podcasting this week, you know, and I constantly tell people you really need to have a strategy in place before you get going, but you really, you can think it through and start getting your wheels moving this week if that's something you really want to mm -hmm. do. Mm -hmm. So why don't we start from like the basics and kind of take people through a roadmap of getting a podcast or, you know, a live stream show out there. Mm -hmm. Does that sound good, Rob? Yeah, I think uh, that's like the beginning stage that you need to really think about is, you know, why are you doing this? So it would be the mm -hmm. first question I would say. And then yes. also, you know, what kind of topics would you like to cover? And then, you know, kind of div dig into that and then start thinking about, well, what is the type of format mm -hmm. that I would want to present that topic in? And yes. that will take you down the path towards coming up with the, the show brand and the mm -hmm. show you know, mission and the show purpose and those kind of things. And then you can come up with uh, your graphics and, mm -hmm. and your presentation and really you have to sell your, your show and your content and you need to have a pitch. It's almost like an elevator pitch of sorts for a startup mm -hmm. of, of sorts about what's the reason for the show, what's the pitch of the show. And um, th that'll help you kind of drill down and figure out what you're trying to accomplish with the show because there's yeah. a lot of goals that can be, <laughs> Um, mm -hmm. established for these things. All right. Yeah. And I think like, you know, when you're deciding your concept, you know, what, what he's saying is mm -hmm. your why, you know, figuring right. out if you're going to be um, a show that's focused on having a guest, like what is your purpose? What are you hoping to get out of that person every right. time? And then right. really honing in on those types of conversations. So mm -hmm. while we're talking about concepts, you know, Rob, you have a co-host show, and you have a single individual hosted show. Why mm -hmm. don't you just share a little bit about, you know, what it's like having a co-host and also hosting something on your own? You know, any differences that you've you've come across when it when you're recording with video and audio? Yeah, I think there's huge differences. Um I, I would say that the biggest difference is um conversation. Uh and and having chemistry mm -hmm. with the person that you have, yeah. if you have a long history with that other person, there are things that come out of the conversation that would not come out 
um, as much in a conversation with someone that you just met or you've, you know, you're just doing an interview with or something like that, unless you have kind of a, a deep understanding of that person and their personality and what drives them and what their motivations are. It's hard to kind of extract value for your audience um, without that kind of context. So that's the advantage of uh, of a co-host situation is that you have that in-depth knowledge of that other person and you may not even have to have guests. Uh, I mm-hmm. that's That's what I really like about co-host type situations is that you don't, there's no requirement that you have to book somebody to be there mm-hmm. on on Thursday at 7 p.m. Eastern. You know, it's mm-hmm. it's you know, you two show up every week at the same time, and you have an outline, and you have goals with the show and things like that, and you can just punch the show out and be entertaining. And I, I think the big thing is whether it's live or pre-recorded. Uh, I think is the big choice that you need to make too. But um, but the guest format I think is a little bit trickier. Uh, I I think it it requires a lot of contextual understanding of the strengths of your guest and also the strength of yourself um, to extract Mm -hmm. value out of the, the guest that's additive to me, the host, because fundamentally the red thread of a podcast is you want to keep that audience coming back every week to the show. And what's the common glue in a, in a guest hosted podcast? Uh, It's, it's the host, right? So your audience that you're attracting is going to be more reliable based on their loyalty to the host. That guest coming in is additive to me, not a replacement for me. And I think that's Mm -hmm. a, a way of looking at it that makes a lot of sense that this person needs to be additive to my views as a host of the show and what my goal is. And I'm increasingly hearing people say that if you're going to do an interview show, you should do occasional episodes that are solo uh, because mm-hmm. then what you're doing is you're establishing your your firm hold or your firm grasp on your audience connecting with you as the host primarily. Yeah. Uh, so there's kind of some controversy around that, but that's kind <laughs> of my, my current view on that. Yeah, I would agree. I've, I have done a couple solo episodes and it, I felt, I had to be very scripted because it's hard for me to come on here and just improvise, right, without mm-hmm. a plan. So mm-hmm. I would have to write out a long script. And then, you know, I I don't read it word for word, yeah. but right. that's what I would need to do for a solo. Now, I we can talk about, you know, developing each episode, you know, as we go along this road to your, your podcast, guys. Um, but that's a little teaser, I guess, about (laughs) what you're going to do when you start that podcast and you need to start fleshing out the details. But I mean, you know, what he is basically saying is you can either do a solo, you can have a co-host with a guest, without a guest. If we're looking at that type of concept, that's what, you know, you really need to think about, right? You can even have Mm -hmm. three people. And if it's virtual, it makes it a heck of a lot easier. However, when he's talking about, you know, that that chemistry, you may see that the chemistry is better in person than it is virtually. I mean, so you, you and your co-host are virtual Mm -hmm. and I mean, you guys have good chemistry, so it just depends on the type of people. Right. Mm -hmm. And so that's really helping you determine like your style, but before you launch a a contrast. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. It helps to have contrast in personalities and, Mm -hmm. and, uh, the tonal voice too. So if you're doing audio, what you want to have is a co-host that has a distinctive voice from you, um, Mm -hmm. but also has a, at times, maybe a contrarian view to you as the host Mm -hmm. or Mm -hmm. because usually there's a primary host, even in a co-host situation. Um, So the host needs to kind of like lead on the intros and the exits and things like that, where the co-host just kind of like is, you know, the, um, kind of in-depth analysis person is kind mm-hmm. of what that role sometimes looks like. It can be, yeah. it can be equal to the host uh, in its presence, but ultimately somebody has to lead this. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> Somebody's got to, right? <laughs> right. Right. Also, it's going to go all sorts of directions, right? It's like, you know, mm-hmm. you don't know what but you're going to get. I yeah. mean, but that's why it's important, like on this road to developing your own podcast to do that comparative research, right? You need mm-hmm. to make sure you're putting together a product that A, isn't already out there. And if 
it is already out there how you can make it different. And yeah. what he's saying by having different voices, different opinions, that's a way to make it different. Sometimes it doesn't have to be, you know, extremely different than other podcasts, right? You know, mm -hmm. but if you have different voices, that really adds that uniqueness. I mean, mm -hmm. what do you say about the comparative research element, Rob? Well, I think to really kind of tap into what you're saying about different mm -hmm. voices, it's not so much the different voices of the context of what they're saying, which mm -hmm. is important. Um, it's more the tonality of the mm -hmm. of the co-host uh, or, or or the guest's voice too. Mm -hmm. So when a person is listening on audio, they're they're clear on who they're listening to. You know, I mm -hmm. think that people may make a mistake of having a co-host that. Um, the two people sound alike <laughs> and that can be confusing to the audience and yeah. it can happen. Um, that's why in s some ways, you know, the, the male and female co host co-host mm -hmm. situation works pretty well too, because women tend to speak differently than men do. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah. you have this contrast that's out there too, but contextually from the standpoint of the content of that, of what's being, being communicated, that's very important too. attitude um opinions thoughts um increasingly political positions um uh, you know experience life experience those are all factors that you have to think about uh with a co-host yeah and you know when we're talking about comparative research you know you really want to kind of maybe put together an excel spreadsheet of all the different podcasts that are out there mm. yeah. um that are in your genre your niche and then listen to them and get a better sense of how can you add right. value to that right. so if you're a thought leader and you want to start a podcast start listening to as many podcasts as you can yeah i agree yeah. with that i think uh that's very helpful for you to Mm -hmm. learn what the what the popular shows in your genre are actually doing and then you can kind of draft off of that to some degree and then maybe do a little bit of a unique twist on some of those strategies that appear to be working um, mm -hmm. and kind of make them your own a little bit you know innovate try new things feel like you're you're really kind of do something different than everyone else is doing i think that is kind of the bigger key to success is that mm -hmm. you do need to be seen as a little bit unique uh, as much as you can. You can't just be a me too show. It's like the aspiration that people have out there for wanting to be just like Joe Rogan is probably a, a um, fool's errand to try mm -hmm. and take on because nobody's going to be Joe Rogan. So yeah, you, you might as well just be you. <laughs> mm -hmm. And that really brings us to like the planning. So if you're right. listening to this, you're a thought leader and you want to start up a video podcast, you know, you've already thought about your concept, you've determined your style, you started your comparative mm -hmm. research, then you have to start planning. You know, Rob, he uses StreamYard. So there's all these different platforms out there that you can consider to put together your video podcast. You know, mm -hmm. Rob, why don't you just tell people a little bit about what makes StreamYard so great as an option for people who are starting to navigate? Yeah, I think specifically the power of StreamYard is really around live um, distribution and live production. Uh, it's got a lot of um, what I consider to be kind of like television capable kind of overlays, graphics, being able to bring in um, comments from Facebook and YouTube into the program, add that contextual layer of interactivity. Uh, mm -hmm. that, that's so compelling, but also being able to present videos, produce stuff in advance of the live program to play it during the show and, and have overlays that re represent the branding and the graphics and, mm -hmm. and um, have motion backgrounds and things like that, which is, which may be considered to be some, to be somewhat of a gimmick um, with, with, with video. And I think that there is a movement out there now around simplicity of your of your video productions and i think that mm -hmm. is an interesting trend line that i'm starting to see a little bit where where people don't have a lot of overlay graphics on their screen mm -hmm. they go full screen maybe a little half transparent logo in the bottom corner of the of the screen and stuff like that but streamer gives you the ability to do all that stuff too and to transition up to 10 people bringing into a show if you want to have that many guests on screen, which is a lot of guests. I think the, the maximum I'd be willing to do is probably like maybe four um, mm -hmm. on and any kind of live experience. <laughs> right. Well, 
that's a whole other element too, is trying to manage the chat plus mm -hmm. monitor the conversation and mm -hmm. keep up with all the transitions and, you know, going from one screenshot to the other screenshot, trying to manage all that plus have a in-depth conversation with someone is mentally challenging. There's no question. Yes. It takes a little practice. <laughs> but <laughs> yeah. that's when, you know, that's where producers like myself come in handy, like having yeah. someone who can help produce it up. You know, I'm a one man band. I can't, I don't really have the time. So mm -hmm. simplicity has become my best friend, you know, and right. I would love to dress it up and have animations and graphics and do all the you know, have all the bells and whistles, but yep. yeah, I mean, it's hard when you have to put it in edit. So it's great that Streamlar StreamYard allows you to do that ahead mm -hmm. of time, right? But you do have to well, be able to play yeah. it all out during in yeah. your live production. Mm -hmm. So I think yes. that's the that's what's different too. Instead of what a lot of people do, if they, they record, they'll actually add mm -hmm. all these elements in post production. Um, yes. Or if you're doing it live, you kind of need to do it in the pre production stage, mm -hmm. uh, so you can use it in the live production. Uh, yes. And that's the ability that, that StreamYard has is to be able to fully produce your show in advance, mm -hmm. um, have all the visual elements there, have all the links and the screen shares that you want to offer during the context of the program. And you just randomly bring them up when they're appropriate in the conversation. Mm -hmm. right. And it, it is easy to to do once you get used to it. I've tried yeah. it out. I think it's great. You know, for me, I just haven't had the time to put together the elements, to make everything ahead of time. You know, yep. the animation I played at the start, I did that in maybe 15 minutes, like before, <laughs> you know, beforehand. What, like Canva or something <laughs> like that? Did you do it in the Canva or, or so some platform I'll create, like that? And here's a good topic. You know, it's all about planning it out and identifying the platforms. And, mm -hmm. you know, when I'm creating content, I use the following apps. I use Canva. CapCut and Cut, occasionally right. Lightroom. And Lightroom's great for photos, but also, you know, if I'm using an image in a Canva, uh, it gives me the opportunity to maybe brighten it up, make it look a little better before I go to Canva. I don't really like using filters. So that's why I, those are like my three go-tos. Mm -hmm. <laughs> How about yourself? What what other programs do you love? Yeah, I have a whole little bunch. I use Canva, <laughs> I use um I use Descript. I use mm -hmm. uh, Paint uh, with Windows. <laughs> nice. <laughs> and there's a bunch of other um, kind of like uh, um, audio optimization tools that I use. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. What, one's called InSounds and one's mm -hmm. called Nomano, which mm -hmm. I do more audio uh, recording productions in the in those two platforms mm -hmm. to be able to optimize the audio audio recordings. But the primary tools that I use is StreamYard and a wave editor, as well as um, Canva and the script, I think. And yeah. I do do a lot of post-production editing in, in the script to pull out filler words mm -hmm. and yeah. um, word gaps and things like that. But mm -hmm. I, I, I don't use it to record any video or do anything like that. I just use it yeah. for the post-production post benefits. And then transcripts is another one that I use. But mm -hmm. But StreamYard is increasingly adding some of this capability too of creating yeah. like shorts and transcripts and mm -hmm. and being able to do those kinds of things too. Yeah. I mean, you know, the platform I use has the transcripts and it has AI and it writes my show notes and it does all my right. chapters. So that like helps me. But I have Descript. I, ha I haven't used it as much as, um, you know, I basically bought it and barely used it. I need no, to no, use no. it this year, yeah. guys. I'm going to use Descript. But I will <laughs> add, um, if you're into the Adobe products, Adobe Audition is also great for audio. So let's talk about names. You know, how do you come up with a podcast name? Rob, how do you, what do you tell people when they're like, uh, you know, what do I name my show? How did yeah, you come hard, up with yours? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's a hard question to ask. Probably the first thing to do is go out and search for, in your genre. Mm -hmm. to try and find other shows, you know, it's as simple as doing maybe a Google search. So if you have an mm -hmm. idea of what genre that you want to create a show about, whether it's, you know, uh, if it's about podcasting or if it's about video creation or if it's about some something else, let's say you're an accountant and you want to do a show about accounting or something like that, mm -hmm. just do a search for accounting podcasts and see yeah. what comes up and and also do it in Apple Podcasts and mm -hmm. Spotify and just see what's out there is what would be kind of the first stage. Um, but even to get to that stage, you kind of have to have a, an idea about what genre of show that you want to create. Yeah. Uh, and then just do like, like you were saying earlier, just do some research and try and find 
kind of like a little hole and a gap. And then probably what you'll wind up doing is having to look for a domain name or something like that as mm -hmm. well. And who owns certain trademarks and things that like that would be the natural next thing. And then you just come up with a list of ideas that you have uh, and compare that with what you've seen online of other people doing that may have a trademark or something like mm -hmm. that. And, and just come up with a list of ideas and then go look to see if the domain names are available for that. And it can be mm -hmm. a derivative like show or podcast or something like that, that may be more likely to be available. Um, mm -hmm. So, so that's kind of the process that I would go through is just make sure that you're not duplicating somebody else's show. <laughs> exactly. Which and when help, it comes to, but... you know, coming up with a name, I always say, you know, once you have that list, run it past your friends, your family, yeah. maybe have people vote, do some research on your industry. You know, are there any terms that people use specifically to your audience that mm -hmm. might be worth weaving into your own intro or into your own, um, I'm sorry, logo and, and your title of your show and really try to hone in on who your audience is and make sure your your logo and your name are are kind of connecting with them through mm -hmm. whatever terms or images that might be specific to your niche. Um, you know, logos yeah. are hard to come up with, but it's always going to bounce off your name. So you want to try to think about it all together and come up with your branding colors uh, and try to stick with them. That's always hard too. I know you have your green and black with StreamYard. I mean, that's not easy to stick with a green. I mean, I would, I would not do well with green for <laughs> video. You know, I have to do more of a jewel tone where uh, green looks great on you. <laughs> good. I'm glad it does because I didn't have any option at picking it. The StreamYard team picked it for me. So mm -hmm. I think they saw my name, uh, Green Lee. And oh, thought, that's oh, a good green. Lay there off you go. It. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I see. I see. <laughs> So, so guys, Greens what have we color, gone through? Right? Yeah. yeah. So guys, what have we gone through? We have your concept, your style, your comparative research, planning, identifying your show name, starting your logo ideas, you know, choosing your podcasting platforms, your editing. You know, when it comes to editing, though, Rob, have you ever hired an editor? Uh, no, I haven't. Mm -hmm. um, but I've had a partner that did a bunch of editing before. Um, yeah. But I haven't hired them per se. But um, mm -hmm. I certainly know plenty of podcasters that have hired outsourced through Fiverr or through, mm -hmm. you know, various networks out there of podcast editors. Um, mm -hmm. And it's, you know, there's plenty of people out there that are looking for work right now to do that yes. kind of stuff. So that's, that's one thing too. If you do need help, uh, there's plenty of people out there that can help you. Mm -hmm. yeah. And one place to search is always LinkedIn guys, because anytime I need help, you go there, you say, Hey, I'm looking for an editor. Right. You'll get like 10. Okay. So <laughs> definitely go there. Um, and yeah. then, you know, let's get into the, the con the, the context, right? So you've decided your niche, you've decided, okay, I'm going to have a guest or, you know, a co-host and I need to plan it out. So Rob, how do you plan out your podcast episodes and with video in mind? Hmm. Yeah, it's a complicated, uh, question to answer because mm -hmm. there are so many variables that go into it. Um, and yeah. it's, it never starts out exactly the way it winds up ending out or ending up to be. Cause mm -hmm. what you're going to find is that you're going to evolve the show and change it over time, um, uh, mm -hmm. based on your experiences, your, your, uh, process of actually producing it, uh, mm -hmm. especially a live show. Um, uh, there's fluctuation. I'm always tweaking my show every week. So you don't have to start out with one format or one way of doing your content and stick mm -hmm. with it forever. You can just pick something that you feel like makes sense to you to start with and then just start doing it. And as you do it, you're going to learn where the pain points are. And if you can <laughs> streamline this or adjust that or do it a little different, um, this aspect of it, but just kind of document it to some degree in like a text outline of some sort, right? Or you mm -hmm. can kind of lay things out of what you know you want to accomplish in a particular episode and just kind of lay it out from a contextual standpoint and a, and a content perspective too. Like what you want to say at the beginning of the show, what you want to say in the middle, you know, when do you want to bring in the guests? When do you want to do this or that? You know, how do you want to start the show? And the, 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 there's a lot of creative energy that goes into that. It's almost like a blank mm -hmm. canvas that you can paint, right? 
So yeah. you're trying to paint a full color spectrum of what this painting will look like. Uh, and you have to start out with like uh, outlines or whatever before you actually fill in the color. So just come up with your kind of structure of what you want to do in your episode and just know that you can change it because if you create it in like a Google Docs or something like that, you can always adjust things and change things in the future. If you have a, a different guest opportunity or a, you, know, you burn, want to bring in multiple guests or if you want to just do a solo show, you can just adjust that outline to, to reflect mm -hmm. that um, and put stuff, you know, take stuff out and put them in when you want to adjust the show. But I think that's the big thing is just kind of come up with a like a like a skeleton of what you want to do with your show, I think is the first thing. Yeah. And like, you know, with on cam ready, I always have a quick little 10 second intro to a sound bite from the guest mm -hmm. and then an intro. Right. And within that intro, right. I try to plug or mention someone that might have, you know, sponsored or contributed mm -hmm. to the, to the podcast. Right. And try to get all that in and then introduce the guest. And I always like to have the guest really tell us more about who they are, because as a TV producer, we were always, you know, introducing the guest and saying, you know, here's, that's it, you know, 15 <laughs> second intro and that's all they are. And it's like, well, right. there's more to a person. And it's important for, in my opinion, the guest in a podcast situation to really give you more about who they are so that people listening have a better understanding of why this guest was chosen. Right. So that's when right. I'm looking at podcasting, I'm thinking, this is an opportunity for the guests to really like bring it. We're yeah. on TV. They don't really have that chance all the time. Right. So <laughs> That's I right, look because at, it's such a short soundbite. It's usually. such a short little. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, some of the things that I would say, you know, just coming from a TV producer standpoint is, you know, he mentioned having a Google document. What I like to do is write out everything I want to say within my intro and even a placeholder for my soundbite. A soundbite is going to be like 30 seconds to maybe a minute from the guest that I'm going to cut and add to my edit later on. So that's what I mean by a sound bite, right? Sometimes I'll have yeah. VO or B-roll that I add to my intro. Those codes are universal across podcasting and TV editors. So you're mm -hmm. going to want to have like a cue for add VO or add B-roll here so that they know what they're doing when it comes to your intro, when you're incorporating video elements um, mm -hmm. to the edit versus where Rob, you know, he's going live. So Rob, I wanted to ask, do you kind of have those cues that you've kind of marked like, oh, I have a graphic for this. I need to play this in like mm -hmm. your Google Doc. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I've got. Uh reminder placements of where I want to be in the show as much as I can. I don't always a hundred percent stick to it. Mm -hmm. um, and it's easy. I mean, I'll create more of an outline that I actually ever use. Mm -hmm. um, that's very common. It's just because yeah. the conversation kind of goes in a different direction than maybe what I thought it would. And, mm -hmm. and I'm not really wanting to control the conversation that much. I mean, mm -hmm. To some degree, if I can flow the conversation into my my outline points, um, that's best, right? So I can make sure I'm tapping. I'm not missing anything on that the guest is kind of setting up for me that I didn't mm -hmm. anticipate, right? Yeah. Which which may be opportunities, right? Mm -hmm. So I I need to constantly be able to jump on threads of conversation that are opportunities, right? To clarify something yes. that maybe wasn't clarified in the outline. And so mm -hmm. that's where being mentally kind of agile is really important, but that yes. comes with practice and experience about mm -hmm. how to listen and listen for things, threads that you can pull on, right. Mm -hmm. To unravel. And, and I think that that's a great way of looking at it. Um, but yet the outline is still fundamental to every production that I do. So mm -hmm. I, I know, especially at the beginning that I'm triggering certain things, I still forget things. And that was a problem. <laughs> like I'll, I'll bring in a comment, a, a live comment and I'll leave it up on the screen too long because I'm, I'm talking too long and that, that that's up on the screen. I can't really <laughs> get deep into a conversation and be managing the, the chat at the same time. So it's, yeah. it, so you, you make little mistakes like that. And I'm really going to work hard on that this week to, kind of mm -hmm. section those live comments to a part of the show. That's the change mm -hmm. I'm going to do this week. So I, I don't get caught up in those that trying to manage my thoughts and manage people's comments at the same time. Yeah. So. 
That's hard. I mean, you know, what he's saying about an outline, just in case you don't even know what that is, right? Like you're, yeah. you're laying out maybe the points that you want to bring up, the direction you might want to go. You're listing mm -hmm. it out, right? In your Google Doc or in another yeah. type of document that works for you. When right. you're beginning out, I would say like you're a new thought leader. This is all new to you. I would seriously write out every single question if you have a guest like that you want to ask and then right. put them in an order that makes sense to you so that mm -hmm. you have a flow. And I would limit it to like 10 to 15 questions. Yeah. Always have like extra questions <laughs> extra, so that right. if in case you do find yourself going faster than you expected, you have additional thoughts to bring up. And I think that'll help you really shape it. Um, mm -hmm. You know, an outline is a great resource as you get more experienced in this. But, you know, I just think if you're starting out and you want to start in like a week or so, write it all out and maybe even share the document with your guest and say, Hey, are there any points that you want to add? Or is there anything I should include outside of this? If it's not a controversial conversation, what do you yeah. think about sharing the talking points and prepping the guests? Like what advice do you have for guest prep? I'm actually okay with doing it. Um, in general, I, I typically don't do it. Um, mm -hmm but I do share with the guests kind of what I'm looking to discuss in the episode. Mm -hmm. um, so they have a mental idea coming into it, what to expect. Um, yeah. The actual details of my, my list of potential questions, I, I don't share with them because I don't want them to feel like they have to cover all those. Mm, um, that's a good so, point. So it's more about giving them the idea of what the theme of the show is and mm -hmm. what, what I would like to cover um, the individual detailed questions are kind of left to me to extract because mm -hmm. there is kind of like the potential that if I give them all the questions, they could answer all my half my questions in their first comment and <laughs> I'm basically cooked. Right. So, yeah. so what they need to do is, is kind of like um, be prompted by me mm -hmm. to answer specific questions at the beginning of the program so I don't run the risk of them just running ahead and answering all the questions in yeah. the first five minutes of the show. So right. <laughs> I guess it depends on how you're prepping your guests. You know, when right. I, we, you know, I would say if you're going to share your questions with them and you're, you're trying to get started and you're like, Hey, this is where I'm planning to go. Like, I want to make sure I ask all these questions. So have mm -hmm. answers, mm -hmm. you know, that could be a great way or to his point, like I will actually send guests, like, here's a list of all the talking points. You know, with Rob, I didn't. I'm like, Rob, you want to talk video podcasting? Okay, great. But yeah. with other guests, I yeah. will list out like, these are the potential topics. And here's what I would love you to provide when I mm -hmm. ask questions, like maybe three tips, maybe advice here. Would love a personal story on this, you know, so that they come to the conversation really prepared. And mm -hmm. I always tell every guest that I bring on to kind of think about their sound bite. So again, the sound bite is really it's a 30 second um, clip of the interview that would go on social media, right? So like a 30 second, 45, maybe a minute. And I tell them to really think about that because if they're going to come to the conversation and start listing out like the top 10 reasons why to do something, the guest is going to get lost in all of this. I have seen it so many times. So like, okay, and now to the eighth, no way. Are we on the seventh? It's like, oh my gosh, I'm lost. So I think it's always wise to tell them at the top of this, list them all out. If you're going to have multiple tips and have it written down next to your screen. So you remember what your top 10 points are and kind of just mm -hmm. tick through them. Like Rob, here we go. We're on a roadmap to podcasting. Here are the f top five things to do. You know, decide on your content concept, determine your style, comparative research, plan, come up with a name. You know, those, that's what I would say to do off the top before you start listing and going into details. So I kind of mm -hmm. will walk through guests. Uh, I'll kind of walk through the conversation with the guest ahead of time in an email and just detail out some thoughts. And that could help you guys if you're structuring them out. Um, mm -hmm. I know we're running, we're really running tight on time. So I just want to wrap this up with more of like the video hurdles, so mm -hmm. when you, before it was like more audio, now you're into video. 
outside of having to play live elements, what do you see are some of the video hurdles that people have been facing as they start to integrate video into their podcasting plans? Yeah, it's just more work uh, yeah. and, and, and challenges for content creators because, mm -hmm. you know, those that have gotten used to just producing audio um, had mm -hmm. it had it pretty easy, actually, even though, yeah. I mean, a lot of audio creators felt like they, they're overwhelmed. Um, but you, it, it is true. You add another layer um, of medium to this and it it may almost double your your work um, that you have to do to get an episode out. Um, so it's, it doesn't have to, I mean, cause I, I do think you can repurpose the same, you know, let's say description titles, uh, metadata to be used for the video or the audio. Um, I tend to, with the, the live shows that I'm doing, I tend to ha have to create all my content up front before the episode. So when I, I stage it even in like a YouTube or LinkedIn or whatever, I, I already have the episode description already written. Mm -hmm. um that goes live with the with the artwork and with everything there there isn't much post production mm -hmm. to do with the show i'm doing everything in pre production mm -hmm. um so that's the that's the real difference if you want to do this convergent strategy which means that you're producing a live show that is then repurposed into an on demand video and audio program is that you kind of tend to have to prepare that in advance if you really yeah. want to take advantage of the opportunity uh, because people want, if you're going to want people to engage this as live content, you're going to have to sell the opportunity to engage in that content as a live mm -hmm. program. And so yeah. you have to do that in, in advance of the program, not at the end of the program. It's a very good point. And it's great preparation. Like right. if you're going to go live, you have to think about everything ahead of time, guys. So this yeah. is wise, you know, but it's also before we go, like you have to be thinking about your marketing strategy, your SEO. There's a yeah. lot that goes into this and you can't overlook it because if you do, you will get no listeners. Guys, I, I talk to people often and they're like, I had one person listen. Oh, wow. Okay. You need to think about what's my strategy. Mm -hmm. So if you're a thought leader and you're going to be podcasting, start showing up on social media, LinkedIn, you know, maybe do some YouTube shorts before you mm -hmm. start posting your podcast there. Be on TikTok if that's something you prefer. Start to build a community wherever you yeah. want to have your audience or where your audience already is. So that when you are starting your podcast, you have maybe a built-in audience. Rob, what are your thoughts on marketing and SEO and all the things that people have to think about when they're podcasting? Yeah, I think it's a it is a steep hill to climb these days. Mm -hmm. uh, I do think that there the noise level that's out there in the market is pretty high. Um, there's a lot of content being produced on a lot of different platforms that is taking people's attention. And that's really what you're battling for is people's attention. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and, and reaching attention is really based on relevance and connection. And, mm -hmm. and so we're seeing an interest on podcasters and online content creators starting to really focus on creating what is being called, which has been called forever is communities, um, mm -hmm. of engaged audiences, um, and increasingly, yeah. uh, making connections with people. Um, that's why live is such an important piece of this is because it, it does create this interactive connection, uh, with an audience that can't be duplicated really mm -hmm. in the same way in a podcast. So it's, yeah. it's really taking a whole nother element and adding it to that. And, and trying to, and then build upon that, right? So you're, mm -hmm. you're basically trying to outreach to your potential listener base based on, you know, the yeah. goals of the, of the show that you had originally mm -hmm. and, and then just get involved. And in, you're also building your personal brand too. That's the yeah. other side of this too, is that your reputation will, will precede your success to some degree and how people perceive is what your influence is in a particular industry or a particular niche um, or influence with a particular group or community. So, you know, however you navigate that um, and then working with lots of uh, consumption platforms is really the key now. And it's, and it's challenging. 
Yeah, it is. It's a lot of work and it's a lot to think about. So if you're looking to start a podcast, you can do it and you can get it going in a week. But you need mm -hmm. to really think through a lot of what we're talking about. You know, outside of everything we've discussed, you also need to potentially think about cost and the time mm -hmm. it's going to take you to put this together every week. Can you fit it into your workflow? How much money do you have if you need to hire someone? Right. You know, finding a sponsor isn't easy, guys. Everyone thinks, oh, I'll find a sponsor. No, no. I have podcasts and they don't have sponsors and it's hard to find them. Yeah. And ads don't really pay much. So there's no. a lot of things that you need to think about and if this is something that you're using to make money don't <laughs> don't go down this road if you're looking at this as a way to create content and thought leadership in your industry go mm -hmm. for it and i wish you all the best of luck rob any final thoughts well on the the monetization part i yeah I, I, I would agree with you. It is um, a challenging thing to do. And you just have to decide in your mind as part of your strategy, um, what is your monetization strategy mm -hmm. that you would like to build um, yes. or create for yourself and then try and learn from others and see what others are doing and, and try and pick up as many tips as you can from people that are out there that are sharing ideas about um, options on ways, whether it's Patreon or whether if it's mm -hmm. doing a, a private community or if it's doing a, a paid subscription on X or Twitter or something like that mm -hmm. and publishing content into those platforms. Now yeah. that may be for, for those that already have a community to some degree, yes. but, but those are all things that you can put in your plan. Um, advertising is a difficult road to go. Now programmatic advertising on the audio side is an option mm -hmm. for just about anybody. If you even look at like a speaker platform yeah, uh, for podcast hosting, um, every plan that you create on Spreaker has the option of programmatic advertising. So you can have automatic advertising in your show mm -hmm. and make a little bit of money from that, but it's all based on audience, right? So you mm -hmm. have to be able to create a show that is growing in its audience reach. And, and that is the, the epitome of the challenge, right? Is that yes. the more you can grow the reach, the more influence that you have with brands, the more um, image that you have with brands as well. I think your professional image is just as important as your podcast reach mm -hmm. um, in building a relationship with a brand. And it's all possible. It's just, you just have to start creating content and build a reputation for yourself. And that can take multiple months to accomplish. Yes, I would agree. Speaking on that, I have an Amazon storefront, guys. <laughs> If you need equipment, awesome. click on my links. Uh, this is also there. I got this from one of the Amazon brands. Guys, that's how I help monetize. For me, it is it is affiliate marketing. It is um, looking at ways to sell my services, right? So as I said, you know, I, I do offer producer services, media training. That all I think to myself as a way to to fund my own projects. Mm -hmm. And I look at this as a way to market and help and educate people because I'm passionate about it. I right. don't look at this as a way to make money. I look at this as a way to build on my thought leadership and my personal brand. And so I yeah. hope that this conversation was useful for everyone listening. Um, Rob, I really enjoy having you. Thank you so much for being here. Yeah, well, thank you for having me too. And I wish you the most luck with what you're doing. And, and, <laughs> and I speak with people um, all day long that are striving to be content creators and wanting to, you know, build a career for themselves, um, contributing mm -hmm. content to the internet and on a global scale. It's, it's really an interesting time. You know, you see what's mm -hmm. happening with YouTube right now, trans yeah. translating all the content that they have into all the languages of the world. And you can kind of see how this content ecosystem is becoming truly global. No. Yes, truly. Well, thank you so much, guys. I'll see you online. Be sure you check out the description for links to everything Rob has going on right now, as well as to my website and a few of the things that we've mentioned during this conversation. And check out our YouTube if you're listening on a podcasting platform and vice versa if you're listening on YouTube. All right, guys. All right. Thank you and see you online.